All right. All right. This is our August community meeting. Thanks everyone for joining. A um, couple of things on the agenda just to start off with. Uh, next week is the Open Source and Gaming Day at Open Source Summit North America. Um, if you are interested in attending, I put in the uh, working doc a code where you can register for free now. So we do have a code for free registration. Um, we're also looking at doing some more things along um, you know, the same model, either in, there's been some requests to do it in Europe, and we're also going to try to do something at KubeCon in November, which is also in San Diego, because that's where all conferences are this year. Um, but if you're in San Diego next week, even if you're not going to the conference, if you just live there or in the area, uh, we'd love to see you, have you join us at the gaming day or just meet up at some point during that week. So uh, the information's in the working doc, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out as well. All right. Um, Robbie, do you want to talk about release planning? Sure. I, I threw this in here just because we didn't have a meeting last month and you know two mm -hmm. months ago when we met, we talked about like what do we think 1.0 looks like. Um, and we're sort of now on a trajectory where we made, I th we think, basically all the breaking changes we needed to for .12 uh, sort of line us up for that being almost a release candidate, if you will, and then 1.0 being sort of the next six-week uh, release, so which would be in early September or mid-September, I believe. Um, so I sort of wanted to, A, you know, mention to people that .12 have been released, has a whole bunch of changes. If you've got configuration of .11, you're going to have to rewrite bits of it for .12. All the examples have been updated. I mentioned in Slack how to update. There was a I found an example on some like the AWS community sites, um, which which was outdated. Uh, so I told somebody how to update that. And but if you're you know running your own game servers, you know you're going to have to to rewrite your YAML between eleven and twelve. And we hope that this is the last time you'll have to do that, uh, and that things will be compatible going forward. Uh, there's also a milestone for the 1.0 release, which currently has eight open issues in it. Um, you know, most of the issues we're trying to tackle between .12 and 1.0 are related to documentation, uh, doing some testing so that when we release 1.0, we actually have some concrete numbers where we believe things will actually work correctly, uh, and finishing up uh, missing functionality in the SDKs is sort of the, the big, I would say, like technical gap of like the any, you know, code that we are missing. Uh, and that actually kind of rolls into Mark's next question, which is about the SDKs. So I don't know if anybody has comments on release cycles or if we want to just go on to the next thing. Cool. Let's go on to the next thing then. Uh, so looking at our milestone, I think the only thing that is functionality um, yeah. Is, okay. So we're we're still waiting for the allocation metrics, um, but we have a PR in place for that, and we're just waiting for Cyril to get back from holidays. Um, so I don't concern about that. The uh, missing SDK functionality across Unity and Unreal, um, I'm kind of worried about since we don't seem to have people in the community to jump on that, or at least no one who's committed to doing the work. Um, I can I can probably tackle, or maybe between us, we can tackle the the Unity side. Um, because I think I've got some experience there, and we've got some people. I'm probably more concerned about Unreal because I've never touched that before, um, and I don't know what to do about that. It also has it's, the biggest gap. Like it also does have the biggest gap, and is also probably the most like uh, of the commercial engines is probably the most likely target of people who want to use Conez as well. So uh, it is probably a priority. Um, I could give it a shot. It's always a possibility. How would we feel about cutting 1.0 with some of the SDKs not being fully feature complete? Is there a way we can just sort of denote, like, this SDK is a work in progress. It's not fully implemented. And here are some that actually work. We're still working yep. on this one. It'll come in a future release. Um, do you feel Ideally, like really I would really love not to do to that. Yeah, okay. but at the same time, if it doesn't happen, maybe we should be blocking, given that that's that's a thing. Rather be saying, "Hey, the performance on this is great," rather than anything else. There is there is some work we've got 
there's some people I know working on some stuff. I need actually there are some people working on some stuff. I'm being deliberately vague. Um, who are using Unreal? Who may be able to do it? I should actually triple check with them and see whether they can do the Unreal work and whether they ended up they ended up having to talk to their internal companies. Um, actually, let me make a note to actually do that. Let me. Yeah, I know, there were a couple of Googlers I know we were chatting with. I can't remember if they're doing Unity or Unreal though. Um, uh, that she knew at least one of the two frameworks that we might be able to, yeah. to poke also. Well, they're going to have these people I know are going to have to do it in some way, shape or form anyway. It's just a very common game studio. Uh, I don't know if we can release it type thing. So um, but I think we can put some pressure on them. Um, okay. So actually, you know what? Let me let me assign that to me. Let me let me make a note on that. Um, now I just remembered that because I think we can that might solve that problem, which is good. Oh, uh, Unity, uh, we use it here, so that might be something I can look at. Uh, Maybe start with some of the simpler ones first. So we've got some of the simpler ones. Like we've got, uh, what do we have? So it's not it's not all of it, thankfully. So you, it's just, I think it's adding some of the other ones. The yeah, watch one's going to be the most complicated, I think. Yeah, so think. Unity only has the not simple ones left, basically. Oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Reserve, I feel Reserve like... probably isn't too bad. But yeah, watch and, and fetching the game server status is, is the other stuff that's missing. And yeah. then conform, conformance tests. I was actually yeah. thinking with... Um, they get the game server status. We do have a swagger JSON. Um, we could probably generate out at least the game server spec format or the game server format out of that, and then probably port that across um, out of like a C sharp generated. I don't actually remember what swagger swagger gen will generate formats. Uh, what are the clients? I don't think it has a Unity, but it does have a C sharp. Yeah. Yeah, the, the problem with Unity is going to be making sure it plays nice with a Unity main thread. Uh, but. Yeah, so there, I think a lot of that work is kind of done um, already. But anyway, I'll let you take a look because you know that, that you stuff that you know better. They use coroutines and stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think the other point there is like if you do know Unity, you should look at the code that is there and make sure it seems reasonable. <laughs> like even if the simpler stuff is done, if it wasn't done well, we should fix that. Yeah, too, right. I think. I think I'm using the right words. I don't know. Okay. It, uh, it runs for me, right? Like I can run the samples, and it seems to be yeah. working on like the very basic example. But that doesn't really mean that it's you know production ready. Yeah. I'd also love to see the Unity on Real SDKs to have like a similar thing to like what we have Connect in other ones, wherein like it waits, it blocks until the SDK server comes up, or retries at least, or something like that. Um, I think we can just do like with the those those both Unity and Unreal use the HTTP endpoint. Um, so we could there there we could do a polling operation or something simple similar to that to uh, to do a wait until that's done. I don't know if we can do that blocking in in, in Unity or not or how that works, but I'll defer that to other opinions. But uh, I can send you send you links to stuff. Okay, I think yeah, Robbie, how would you feel, how do you feel about if we just if we ended up releasing 1.0 and we're like, hey, this is where they're at now, and there's more stuff, and we just put a big note on it. I mean, I'm I'm okay with that. I mean, I think, like you said, if if those are the ones that people really really want, then, then mm. that's a little bit unfortunate. But we do have a number of other SDKs that work, you know. And like yep. I think Steve, you guys are using the Node.js one, and, right? And so we have ones that we know work, and I think we can say Agonis itself works. And if if you really need these missing SDKs, like please come help us finish them. Right? Yeah, that, yeah. And I think that's reasonable. I think that's reasonable too. Cool. How does that feel to you, April? She's not. I can't yeah. find the mute button, but I can do the hand signals. Yeah. Control D. Yeah. Control D okay. is the winner. Is that, that's the mute. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Shortcut key. Today I learned. Okay. <laughs> um, you you want to promote bugs? That seems really weird. No, I I'm just saying as there. I actually think most of them. Were, I thought there were more. <clears throat> I just wanted to do a quick pass through to see if there was um, anything that's a bug that we were like that should definitely be fixed before 1.0. Mm -hmm. um, but now I'm looking through it. I actually someone's literally just had a seg fault with the C plus plus SDK, but I'd like to get more details on that. So yeah, I was going to uh, mention. I just saw that in Slack and. Speaking of like SDKs actually working, like that seems bad if it doesn't run. So 
Yeah, but the weird thing about that one is actually that the simple version works, but his doesn't, or theirs doesn't, um, yes. which has me confused. I mean, they paste the code in, so it should be relatively easy to run their code and reproduce. So I assume it crashes for us, too. Yeah. Um, weird. I don't know enough. I don't know. Yeah, but like, yeah. this is where we could really use some more C++ help. We should, we should see CC and our fellow Googler who's doing a lot of C++ work. Yes. Uh, actually, yeah, it's also good stuff that we can promote. Like, we can put a call out on Twitter for help. We can ask people next week. In, uh, open source gaming day. Oh, ping! There we go. I just pinged Greg. It has become our de facto C plus plus person. Cool. All right. Okay. So it doesn't doesn't look like there's anything else that's jumped out at anyone else. Which is good. That makes me happy. Uh, the only other thing I was going to mention, just because it's fun, and uh, and and um, April mentioned that uh, she put apparently she put some some Slack emojis that we we're all going to have to find uh, inside there. I I wanted to add some little bot commands to make things easier when like troubleshooting or helping people. Um, so I added uh, bang like what version, which is literally like. Can you please provide your Ghana's version, your kubectl version, and like your cloud provider or hardware configuration? Basically, like what we do for bugs, because uh, I found that was a question I was asking over and over again. Um, and I also added bank troubleshooting, which is a, a link to our troubleshooting guide. Yep. And Robert's just trying that out right now. Um, and I also want to add some. I've got some some links to add to the troubleshooting guide. I want to add as well. Um, if there's anything else that you're like, this is a thing that I keep seeing, and it would be really handy if we had a, a bang to like link to something or something like that, then like just ping me and let me know if there's anything else we can add just to make some community help stuff easier and more reproducible. Are those documented somewhere? Uh, no. <laughs> How do how do we find out what commands you can run? Uh, actually, that's a good point. Why don't I write a write a bang help? Uh, available. Tell you when you first join. Actually, that's a good question. Uh, it's been a while since I've joined, and I can't remember how to get back to like the Slack uh, bot. Please, sorry, like for input phrase. You ask a good question. Um. Uh, we could also like pen something to the top of the channel. We could too. Uh, can you ask good questions? Uh, Slack list Slack bot responses. Uh, yeah, I asked fine. Slack bot what you can do, and it says. I searched for that on the help center. Not helpful slide, huh? Uh, that's slide that is disappointing me. That is a good point. How do we, like, that would be useful. <laughs> People know that that's a thing. Um, I, I would say let's pen a thread. Or, you know, pen a message to the channel. Yeah, and what happens when we add more? I guess we just add it to it again. Yeah. Um, ooh, I actually just thought of something else as well. Okay, I want to tell people, like, go to GitHub to see how to talk to Slack bot. Like, yeah. User -friendly. I'll add one other thing to the agenda. We don't. Uh, we don't have many good first issues. Um, yeah, we don't have many good first issues or help wanted tickets anymore. Um, I think we just did all of them and haven't gone back through and uh, Added added new labels to that. Um, I think help, like good first issues are usually really nice. Uh, we should probably go back through at some point and do this. Uh, maybe especially around the SDKs. Yeah, 
Yeah, I also wonder if it would help if we kind of called out like the language specific stuff. Um, just trying to think of ways to make it as easy as possible for someone who, you know, maybe knows the Unreal Engine. Like, what's the easiest way for them to see that they are needed? It's probably also about time we did a, a little ticket triage. There's probably some stuff in here we can close. Yeah, we well, are we still going to look at like having the bot come in and do all of that? Are we still um, wanting to have Prowl and all that jazz? That's, yeah. yeah, so go on. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, Robbie. That's actually a really good point. Yeah, so my, my plan for Prowl is to try and set it up as sort of part of the load testing stuff. I poked um, Ilker. Uh, like a week or so ago to figure out what his load testing setup was. And he sent me some work in progress code, which I had to rebase, um, but I think is now rebased against head. So I can try to run his load testing and see if I can reproduce it, um, at which point I can send a PR and we can try to get that checked in. And the idea with Prow would be like, the first thing to do with Prow would be something we're not already doing. So not try to replace functionality, but try to do something yep. new and additive, which is, the thing that Prow can do that Cloud Build can't do, which is run something on a schedule that's not tied to pull requests. And so the idea would be to try to run the load testing framework you know, once a day or something like that, uh, probably on like a different cluster that we run our EDEs on um, and get sort of a new signal going back to the project about so how we're doing you know, on a slightly slower cadence than PRs, um, but still something consistent. So uh, as we do that, like we can think about what other little like Prow plugins we might want to run. So like, I think there's like, I don't know if the issue closer is part of Prow or if that's in Fedabot. I don't know if how, yeah, I don't how know. you get Fedabot to, to run against your stuff. So I'll try to ask Eric about that. There are some other GitHub bots that will do similar things as well, like 90 day closes and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, I, I can't remember. I remember we had this conversation ages ago. With I'm just thinking about like long term. Um, and like being able to do like ideally maybe probably roll back like all the cloud build stuff and move it into Prowl. Does the Prowl cluster run inside our project or it runs inside a separate project? Uh, our project. It runs in our project, cool. No, I'm, I'm just thinking when about- you say, When you say Prowl cluster, what do you mean? The cluster so, where the Prowl control plane runs or the cluster where the, the jobs run that actually execute the tests? Uh, so I'll, I'll give you the concrete example I was thinking of is like one of the things CloudBuild does is it pushes stuff up to App Engine and that's just easy because we're in the same project and so it makes life easy. Um, is that going to be an issue using Prowl, for example? Yeah, so I think there are two ways we can run Prowl. Uh, one is we can run the whole stack ourselves, right? We can right. have a Kubernetes cluster that runs Prowl. Um, if we do that, then we are complete control over like what the URL for the results looks like and everything else. We also have to maintain Prowl. Yep. Um, you can then have Prowl point to its own cluster to run the, the jobs or a different cluster. The other alternative, which is the one I proposed, is let's let the you know, Kubernetes and prod folks run the Prowl control plane and keep it up to date since they maintain that code and we don't have to yep. worry about it. At which point we basically bring our own cluster. So we say, ah, that's right. you know, we submit jobs, but you execute them in our cluster and that cluster can be in our project, yeah, which means it can easily push to our app engine instance. So. Got it. And then we can do we can do what we like from that. That makes life yeah. easier. And I think we can even do things like like the load testing in project A and the regular EDE stuff in project B so that you know we don't have to worry about quota issues as much. Yeah, I don't think quota is going to be an issue anyway. That's fine. Okay. But no, that that makes sense. That makes sense. Awesome. No, that sounds really good. That sounds really good. So far, so far my st string of of bash functions and cloud functions and stuff seems to be fine, but yeah, one day it will break. It's working well for what it does. <laughs> it's enterprisey. Cool. Um, I don't have anything else. Does anyone else have anything else? I don't know. I'm just looking through the open bugs uh, to see if there's anything. It's like Yark opened a bug in January about packing, packing not working correctly, uh, which I don't think really went very far. And then there was a bug opened about the fleet autoscaler spawning extra game servers with the Gone 0.6. I don't know if that's worth trying to reproduce. Um, and is that is that a stale issues? Yeah. Also, is that a blocking issue? Like, if it self-regulates eventually, like, mm, right. um, 
the and it's one about the sidecar occasionally failing to start up yeah but i don't know if anybody's been able to reproduce i i've seen that show up i have conversations in slack wherein uh where are they? they're on gke though that's weird they, yeah, they said it only happens if they have no pool auto scaling turned on yeah that's a really weird, weird one so um, i don't know if we'll have, if that would be something it would be probably good to try to reproduce and yeah at least understand the behavior um the only other thing not as a bug i brought it up the other day not that everyone not that the uh where was it where i was doing as a feature basically pulling in all the node addresses straight into the game server rather than having the single address um that being said i think you know we could do that as a non-breaking change just make it additive like leave the old address there and then just add all the rest of the addresses and then if people really want that oh there was another feature request that seemed relatively easy to implement and might might help people in production so i was kind of curious uh, see if you guys have any feedback uh, somebody asked for a configurable log level for the sidecar because they said that normally like the sidecar is too verbose like they just want to see warnings and errors and not all the input messages that show up all the time have you guys had like any experience like debugging the sidecar where you found it to be you know hard to do or onerous because of all extra log spam is that something you would use i think we notice when we uh, we look at our production log we, we do get a lot of chatter from like i think do we filter out my namespace or well in google itself you can select which pod you or a container you list uh, you lo view logs from so i simply click on the game server rather than on the sidecar and that problem is solved for me but if someone wanted to debug sidecar i can see how it would be a bit more difficult yeah the yeah, stack driver does make it easy because you could always like like say don't give me everything from the health pings for example and it would just strip everything out but um I mean, I mean, I can see it being useful. I'm not like, yeah. I'm trying to figure out how how widespread of a feature request it is. If it's if it's a common use case to try and look at those logs, yeah. or if they're commonly getting in the way, um, or if it's you know easy enough to sort of work around them using your log collection pipeline for most people that it's not worth trying to to work on yet. I guess are we, are we thinking we might separate logs into different levels? So you might have uh, in debug logs and info log. Yeah, the log levels are already, I think, annotated in the output. Like there's info, mm. info, warning, error. And the person was just saying, like, there's so many ones at level info that aren't really useful for debugging that it's making it hard to spot the error and warning ones. And I'm guessing they're like basically like a check. Yeah, most of the health check, which happens really frequently. And uh, they basically just like a configuration option to say like for this fleet like set the sidecar to just warning and above because then I'll see the relevant stuff. Yeah, I think there's an interesting discussion about whether that should be at a fleet level. I mean, I guess. Or you could have yeah, both. I... You could do it at the install level and then also be able to override it at the fleet or game server level or something. Yeah. yeah, I mentioned on the issue, like you could either do it like mm. at a per game server, per fleet or whatever basis, or you could do it system wide and try to figure out like, is it something you want to configure differently for different fleets in the same cluster? And the answer is probably. You probably like, yeah, if something goes wrong, you might want to switch it out at some point. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. It sounds like definitely not something we are trying to prioritize for 1.0. Maybe something people, people would be interested in. More in the game term. Um, yeah, uh, so one bug uh, which I currently working uh, on is uh, container crash before ready, not move to should restart. So this one I think we uh, documented so uh, and uh, it should be prioritized, uh, but it's not so easy to uh, like prevent in the yeah, so I, I will have a discussion uh, later, but uh, I think uh, we have stated like four uh, strategies for health check, but uh, some of them is not working yet. So this is also good to fix. Um, I mean, uh, the uh, this uh, restarting policy 
uh, this game server, like when it's in fleet or alone. Yeah, I remember seeing the conversation about that. Is I guess I can't tell if is the current behavior not matching the documentation, or are you trying to make the local SDK server match the documentation and the behavior for the? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, it it doesn't match for now because we uh, Mark uh, tracked this as an issue like 18 days ago, so we need to fix that I think before one at all. Yeah, the one that yeah the the thing that I think doesn't follow the behavior of the sorry the thing that the behavior that doesn't match the documentation now is that like I said in the bug if um, if the pod crashes before uh, it has been marked as ready it should restart in case it like kicks back into being fine um, but it doesn't do that it marks itself as unhealthy immediately. Yeah, I, I noticed that when we were trying to decide if we wanted a blocking connect call because if something comes up and then crashes, it will never go to a healthy state. Right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas in theory, what should actually happen, and it would have hidden that particular bug as well, which would have been fun and a whole other thing, is if it like comes up before the sidecar and crashes, then it should restart, come up, and then try and reconnect, and then finally reconnect and continue on its merry way. Um, it should have a chance to become healthy. Yeah, it should have a chance to become healthy. If it crashes after it becomes ready, then yeah, that's bad and like die and go away. Um, Hey, is that is that going to hide like a large category of bugs though? Where like if a game server takes a while to become ready, you just end up with game servers that are crash looping but not marked as unhealthy, such that like people might not notice and just have like a whole bunch of, of compute with crashing game servers. I think yes, but I think if we combine that with the fact that the health checks are still required. So if you're crashing so often that your health check never fires, then you're going to move into unhealthy anyway, and at that point, like you you bump out. And I think that's okay, a. Cool. I, th I think personally, I think that's a decent compromise. Okay, so yeah. you won't end up in an infinite sort of crash loop until you become ready at least once. Yeah. You'll still fill your health checks and go to unhealthy based on health checks not happening, based on your parameters for how long you're willing to wait initially. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, that seems yeah. good. And because you have an initial delay as well in your health check, so you can actually control how many times, like how long you're willing to wait for that crash loop to kind of happen if it's happening. Yes. That would be that would be the ideal. The ideal scenario, I think. Okay. Alex, did that make sense? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I wrote I wrote the code ages ago, and I think it was actually uh, Cami who was like, "Hey, if I delete a pod, it, the game server doesn't go away." And I was like, "Oh, that's bad." And then I didn't actually look at the health, the health, the health of the contract that we had, and so that's kind of my fault. Yeah, I I think the current issue is that uh, we moving uh, to. Is, Scheduled and from scheduled, to, we can uh, then uh, move to uh, unhealthy. Uh, for example, if there is no reports, and uh, uh, so I uh, currently hard is to that, distinguish. I was going to say, is that the issue? I thought the issue was actually that the health checker that looks for crashes in the pod is moving it to unhealthy. Uh, yeah, Without health checker uh, does that. Does that, but uh, we cannot distinguish uh, the reason. So uh, I think. We can discuss a bit later, but I have a, a, a test to reproduce this scenario. Okay. At least. Cool. Yeah. Cool, cool, cool. I will leave it in your capable hands. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The other thing that might be worth talking about, as long as we're here and we have a few minutes, is the issue that uh, Puna opened last week about um, sort of release cadence. Uh, the six week, both the six week cadence, the time between release candidate and final cut for each release, and um, running things from master branch. There were sort of multiple meta points. It's issue number nine eighty nine. Puna, I don't know if you want to to jump in and give any, any background on that one. I see that you unmuted, but I can't hear you yet. I've linked the issue in the meeting notes also, if people haven't yeah, found it yet. 
Yes. While we're waiting for the the not too many good first issues or help wanted tickets, do you think that's because the issues that are left are more complicated, or we're not like filing like the simple things I, that are? I also head, just uh, haven't backlog. gone through them, or usually, I think I usually end up applying labels to it. So it's probably also on me that I haven't actually looked and gone to see if that's a thing that's going through, or even thought about how we can ask where we should ask for help. Um, I probably like, I like having the good first issues at the very least, probably more than anything else. Um, some of them are definitely more complicated though. Just looking at that top bug where we're like, uh, Game server marked unhealthy when using the REST API. We probably should have something that tests the REST API. I don't even think we even have a conformance test for that. That should probably go into our list of missing. Here we go. Ah, that's pretty. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. OK, so the, yeah, I switched to my laptop. Um, the problem that that is there is one week. Well, mostly that, that's the problem. Um, like when you release um, on a day and give timeline of uh, trying it out within a week, people may be like out of town or something. They, cannot, they wouldn't give them enough time to um, try. But if we have intermediate releases, um, then somebody can basically pick up the change, make sure at least their change works, or they can apply their change to their, um, like, start using their change uh, versus waiting for um, that to happen after six weeks. Um, so one way to do, to do that, we can have a dev branch and uh, regularly, um, even on demand, uh, we can create their, um, like things that needs to be deployed, um, like the YAML files and the uh, images. And then um, uh, people can try on that one. And when it's stable, then merge on the master. So there is separation. Uh, and if there is a hot, hot fix um, that goes to the uh, dev branch, it, instead of getting everything from the dev branch, we can just apply that hot fix. And then release. Um, we don't have a good story, I think, for the hot fix or, or, I mean, be missing something. So those are the, the issues that was on top of my mind when I opened that box. So I was going to say on that, we do we do actually do build images for each master. We actually build images for each PR and each master as well. Uh -huh. um, PRs are easier. We actually have a few. If if we if we look at a PR. You will probably notice that at the bottom of the comment, there's actually a um, a line to install that particular version for that particular PR, and that we keep those images around. So that's kind of there. I don't know how many people actually use it. Um, so for each build of a PR, there's 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 that. I think it would be lovely to do something similar from master. Um, Maybe on each each commit, we could have like a line where you're like, just get check out this commit, and then there's the Helm install line, and you're good to go. Um, that's like that's basically just building a page that does the thing, which is not terrible. Uh, we keep those images for like 30 days from memory, um, so we could definitely do that. I think that's kind of cool. What was I going to say? Uh, building out dynamically creating the store YAML we don't have right now, but we could do in theory. Um, we just haven't done it. The, the, hel the Helm's easier, actually, because you can, uh, whatchamacallit, um, you can pass in the arguments for what the image name is. It makes things a bit easier. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know if that's up to date. Oh, and is that up to date? The, oh, no, yeah. all, yeah, well, as long as you run the, the make target, it should be up to date on each of those PRs, right? Um, I don't think we're verifying that is. The yeah, we don't, we don't set the. So there's a there's a um, each image gets tagged with the current release version and then like the short hash of the Git thing. So we don't generate oh, the install YAML for each one. Um, so it looks like uh, 
So it looks like right because on the PR where you said cut the release branch, it like yeah. tweaks. Yes. Yeah, and, and all the and like we we we, uh, we release on that actual one. So that's like the Helm install for our PR. I'm looking at, for example. Right. Um, so we could do something similar where it's like you know uh, git fetch git fetch this particular SHA um, for this particular one, and then Helm install using these commands. Maybe that's good enough. Um, or we could have a repository of them. We could stick them somewhere. I don't know if we want to do like a Helm chart for each development release. That probably is maybe a little bit overkill. I don't know. When you modify the install YAML for a release, do you have a script you do that with, or is that done by hand? Uh, it's the same one as make gen install. So it actually doesn't change. Um, so if we're doing like the 1.0, it's always going to be 1.0 way through. So it's basically the default is like 1.0.0, and then we just tweak it for for like that's what the the development scripts do. Actually, they do exactly that step, and they just pass in what your SHA is attached to the base base revision, and that's it tells it how to install on Helm. Um, but yeah, I like I mean I like the idea. It's just a question of how we want to do it. Um, do you see value of having a dev branch? Master is the dev branch, really. But so we need to have, to have a well. We already tagged them by a release a tag, right? So that should be fine. But um, I, I've seen in the GitHub repository there are a lot of teams that use a dev and master branch. So somebody who wants to fork well branch from the master, they know that that's the stable one, that's the release one, and then they develop on top of that. Um, then merge their changes. Um, that, yeah, I don't know. That, yeah, personally, I, don't know. That, I feel like that makes things complicated because people don't know what to fork from when they need to add stuff. Uh -huh. And then we have to merge their stable stuff. If there's big rebases and there's conflicts and like all that kind of stuff gets really weird. That's mm -hmm. my only concern. Okay. But I, I do like the idea of saying like, hey, if you want to grab the latest, you know, from commit from master, you know, here's an easy way of installing it. Like that's cool. Mm -hmm. It looks like zero eight one is the only time where we've done like a yeah. patch release. So, can you quickly describe like was that a commit that was sent directly to the zero eight zero release branch that wasn't sent to master, or was it sent to master first and then sort of copied over to the release branch? Uh, I think actually we cut the we we cut. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to remember. Uh, how did we do that? Yeah, we had to create a release branch because we were we had already moved past that point. So we were doing this. Basically, we did that half fix so we could get stuff up on the marketplace for GKE. Um, right. And uh, but I'm wondering if you like, did you push something into master and then cherry pick it into the release branch? I feel like we created. Or did we oh create a patch directly against the release branch? You ask a good question, and I cannot remember. Because uh, when I look at, at GitHub, there, yes. there is a branch with the label of every release, right? Now, yes. Right. So presumably, you could start with from that branch and move there sideways without pulling everything from master, which I think is what Poon is getting at, which is, you know, I want to just make one hot fix to a release. Yes. How do I do that without pulling everything in from master? And that's how you do it, right? You start from the release branch, make your fix on that release branch. And move forward, and oftentimes that's a cherry pick where you you put a commit into master and you put the same commit into the release branch. You know, possibly slightly differently depending on how far they've drifted. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes you just put a commit in the release branch that doesn't go into master. And I think you know both those workflows are I think relatively well supported with the master being the development branch, and then we create a release branch every time that there's a release. Generally, those release branches don't go anywhere because we've created an extra release instead of hot fixing. Uh, but occasionally, you end up hot fixing the release branch. And I remember yeah. something else. Um, something that triggers is another thing that triggered it is was we put a uh, stop, do not merge your changes on during this one week of trial. If we had a develop branch, those changes still could go to the develop branch. Uh, only the hotfix would end up to the master branch. Um, and it would help fixing the a lot of complex issues when there are a lot of, like if there are 10 issues waiting for a week to be merged, um, there would be conflict like one by one, they need to slowly get in, then resolve the conflicts, and then the next one goes in. So it's, it makes the um, PR merge a little bit harder after one week. 
yeah, so right. So there's a trade-off between like how long sort of that code slush lasts and how much builds mm. up by the end of it versus the overhead of, of main, basically having to, to cherry pick everything that goes in so like maybe a, a small percentage of stuff that goes in during that week over to the release branch, right? Mm -hmm. I think right now the it's sort of shifted on like the less work for maintainers not having to cherry pick. And we'll just slow people down a little bit for that that one week. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we can shift that balance based on the PR volume. Like if if at the end of that week we end up with lots of stuff and it feels overwhelming and it destabilizes things, then we need to just you know gradually merge stuff during the week. I think will be the answer. I don't think right now, like during the last release candidate, it was like super quiet. You know, everybody was just sort of waiting for the week to end. You know, Mark was on vacation and I was busy doing other <laughs> stuff, right? So there wasn't a lot of merging going on anyway, but you know, I'd, you know maybe during previous you know, release candidate weeks, it's been worse. Yeah, usually actually it goes, it goes quiet. Everyone takes a break for a week for a bit, make sure everything's stable. Do some, I usually do some I, testing and, and documentation fixes during that time, which needs doing anyway. I would say it also ties into the other comment on that issue of, you know, does the release cadence work that we've been using? Should we change it to a 4.2, a 5.1, or even something completely different? Should we um, randomly create numbers? 7, 6. <laughs> Roll a dice each week. That's how many, how many weeks you get, and then it rolls forward. I mean, I'm, I'm happy with the 5.1. I think it's a good compromise on like, um, what should we call it? I, I, I totally hear you, Prima, as like people may not have time within a week. But if people don't have time in a week, I'd be surprised if they have time within two. But that seems like a long time for us to like wait on stuff. Um, that's, the, that's just my opinion, though. I don't know how you feel about it. But it sounds like it sounds like having uh, finding some way to set up interim, like basically being able to make it easy to set up. Uh, hey, this is your build. If you want, if you want to grab the latest from Master, here's a here's a nice way to do it. Um, would probably be a good a good happy place in between, without us having to change a bunch of stuff. Are we? going to close this issue then and just make a new one for documentation or? Uh, so there'll probably need to be some kind of dynamic page type thing or something along those lines that creates this page mm -hmm. uh, just because it's a little bit dynamic. Um, why don't I? Uh, it's just someone needs to build it. <laughs> it's the short answer. Yeah, or, I can. There's a couple of examples I've seen trying to find them. Like, GRPC has a process that does the daily branch cut. Yeah. But I don't know what is doing the process, but it exists somewhere. That's the only one I've seen that has done like a steady daily kind of uh, build update. I don't know if Kubernetes has that. Yeah, I mean, I figure it's actually rather than doing daily. I mean, I mean, we could do daily. I think it's actually easier because the, the the build chain stuffs already exists there for um, basically creating a, a a master build every time because mm -hmm. it's it's literally a cloud build that runs on everything. <laughs> so the the contents there, assuming the build passes, and nothing flakes. Okay, so we'll find a good way to do that. Um, we just need someone to sort of own that. Uh, but this would be the place to find somebody to volunteer. That might be a good good first issue to write up. Because it seems it's you know sort of tangential to like game servers actually functioning correctly, and you know, you're not gonna walk in and break everybody's stuff if you try to you know build a paint app engine to show builds. Right? Actually, does this help you as well? Um, 
Robbie, with uh, your performance work, because you're probably going to want to grab the latest master anyway to do yeah. your builds. Yep. Um, so you'll need something that gives you that information in some way, shape, or form, right? That's true. I hadn't thought about how to automate that. Manually, it's not too bad, but yeah. automate is really trickier. I'm almost, I'm almost wondering if we could do like a little either cloud function or an app engine thing that literally like just does a little like JSON blob that's like, here's the latest image, and then we could pull it in from JavaScript on the website, and then you could pull it in for your thing. Yeah, I know Kubernetes shoved some text files in cloud storage somewhere. Right? Oh, that works too. Curl, something, curl yeah. Things. <laughs> so basically an endpoint with something, right? Yeah. Yeah, cloud storage would be fine too. That would work as well. Um, Yeah, but the, so maybe I'm just going to run into this and have the same problem as Puna in a couple of weeks there. Um, but that's actually really, I could actually, I kind of like that cloud storage idea just because we could put that as a step in um, in the cloud build. Like if it's the master branch, um, I've, yeah. seen some, I've seen some hacky stuff in cloud build where it's like you write a bash script that basically says if it's, if it's, if the environment variable equals master, then do this thing. Sure. Um, then we could just chuck it up in, in cloud storage. The other, is there any other clever way of doing that? No, actually, that sounds like a really good way of doing it. Yeah, and then you just to figure out what it is, you just curl. Yeah. Um, I'm just writing some notes in the thing. We only have seven minutes left. Does anybody have anything else that they wanted to uh, cover while Mark is typing? That was, that was all I saw scrubbing through the issues quickly. There are some issues. Oh, give me a second. <laughs> There are some issues that um, I opened for al um, multi-cluster allocation policies and uh, the Alcure service. Um, those, those are so one. The biggest issue that I saw, and I haven't uh, filed a ticket for that yet. Uh, we marked the Alcure service as v1. That's still in progress. Um, it's not documented, so I think it should be fine to basically roll it back to v1 alpha 1. Um, but I'm not sure if this is a good idea or not. And there are changes going to, that's going to break the server APIs, like gRPC. Is it, this is specifically for that multi, the multi-cluster allocator that's not quite, not quite done yet. Yes. Robbie, do you have thoughts on that? I know you did all the V1 work. Right. More time, I was reading about the game server for unhealthy rest issue. So, would it be okay to change the V1 to V1 alpha from the allocation for, service? For the allocation service. For the multi cluster allocation service. I thought we'd left the multi-cluster stuff as alpha one, but if that one was underneath allocation, I might have gotten it swept up when doing the allocation change. Is that is that what you're saying happened, Puna? Yes, there is so. an allocator service. It's recently changed the name to um, Agonis Allocator. That's basically um, a load balancer service that uh, accepts calls with the certificate from external, uh, external to the cluster, like from a matchmaker outside the cluster. And um, that also is used for talking to other clusters, but uh, we are not, like, the API is not finalized and it shouldn't be marked as V1. So, so it's marked as V1. Um, I'm trying to find the file in question. Um, okay. So let me make sure, because there's the policy. I'm gonna send it to you. So, in, so the, in package APIs multi cluster, v1. yeah, it's, it's still so package APIs multi cluster is still v1 alpha one. That's so all the game server allocation policy stuff is still v1 alpha one. Right, but in package APIs allocation v1, there's some multi cluster policy settings, 
which I think might be what it is. Um, I sent it to the group chat. Well, we have three minutes. Uh, uh, that's, oh, I see. Okay, so that's, uh, where are we? Let's annotate that. Got it. So that's basically actually just the end point. Yeah, I don't think there's any issue there because that's not actually the end point that the CRD uses for allocation. So I don't think that matters for that particular um, line. No, yeah. no, no, the API server it doesn't use this site. Yeah. 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 yeah, I don't I don't see any issue with that. I see okay. what you're saying. So we should be able to switch that back to B1L1. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. yeah, that seems fine. Cool, cool, cool. That makes sense. Do you want me? Do you want to send a PR to that Puna, or do you want me to do it? Sure, can go ahead. Thank you. Okay, I'll take care of it. Got it. All right, we have ninety seconds left. If there's anything, anything else? <laughs> Not that Robbie's counting them down or anything. <laughs> All right, well, we did record, so we'll get this up um, on the YouTube and we'll link it out on the, the docs as well. And um, hopefully we'll see some of you next week, maybe. Otherwise, we'll have our next meeting in September at some point. We'll have to figure out the exact date because I know uh, we have a conflict with a big internal conference, I think. In oh, there's that too. We all have planned. So um, I'm also going to be traveling during that time. We should probably try and make a meeting before the 1.0 release just to make sure everything's copacetic. So we'll find the right date for that. And then we'll send out uh, you know, the invite and all that. And then we'll also uh, you know, put it in Slack and the mailing list and all that good stuff. So and then we can 1.0 it. Yay. Yay. Thanks, April. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. See you soon. All right. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, see you. Bye. Bye.